So again, thank you for joining us. We are going to get started. Um, this webinar is part of the RHEL Learning Series on Early Warning Systems, and it's an event hosted by the Regional Educational Laboratory Northeastern Islands. At this time, I'd like to introduce Jenny Scala, who is one of our researchers, who will be moderating today's webinar. Good afternoon, Jenny. Have a good session. Great. Thanks, Erin. And hello, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today in this webinar. We're really going to be focusing on the state roles in supporting early warning system implementation and hearing from two states that have been doing work to date, um, and those are Massachusetts and Minnesota. Um, so here's our agenda for the day. We want to first start off by giving everyone an overview on what the state role in early warning system implementation can be to make sure that we have that same understanding and same foundation. And then we're going to hear from Massachusetts and their early warning indicator system, um, what their indicators are, what types of support on implementation that the state has um, provided to districts, as well as how this early warning system work connects to other um, work at the state education agency. And then we'll switch gears and hear um, about Minnesota's early warning system and what their indicators are, their implementation support, and connections to other state work that's going on in Minnesota. Then we'll close with having some questions and answers. So throughout the session today, feel free to post questions in the chat box, and we'll be collecting those and then asking those of the presenter towards the end of our session. I want to just give a quick overview of the objectives. So throughout this webinar, and as the webinar finishes, you'll have a more in-depth understanding of the role that state education agencies play in supporting early warning system implementation at the district and school level. Um, also, you'll hear some of the strategies and examples that Minnesota and um, Massachusetts have provided um, in terms of supporting implementation of early warning systems and their districts and schools um, as well. So um, as this poll is happening, I first want to introduce, um, actually, um, Jenny, do you want to push the poll out? As we get going, we wanted to hear from you in terms of the two biggest challenges that you face regarding early warning system implementation. And we know that there could be a long list, so we want you to choose two of those. And while you're doing uh, the poll, I do want to just provide a brief introduction to our presenters today. Um, Dr. Susan Terrio is a principal researcher at the American Institutes for Research, and she um, has been leading and conducting research on state and federal education efforts for more than 18 years to build the capacity of high-needs districts and schools. Um, she's been involved in early warning system work since 2008, as she was part of the National High School Center and co-developed many of the early warning system materials and tools that were developed um, by the National High School Center, which was housed at the American Institutes for Research. Kate Sandell is a senior policy analyst at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education where she serves as a research project manager for Early Warning Indicator System Project, which is part of the state's longitudinal data system. Um, and she is currently developing um, an expanded early warning in indicator system that predicts high school students' likelihood of meeting college success outcomes. And they already have a system that helps from um, providing early warning data from ninth graders to all elementary and secondary students. John Gimple is a state implementation leader at the Minnesota Department of Education, where he provides leadership and development assistance to the state education agency divisions to create and maintain environments that support the implementation frameworks and effective delivery and measurement of services to schools and districts, including the Minnesota Early Indicator and Response System work. All right, in terms of our challenges that we have, it looks like a lot of people, over half of the people on the call today, have said that one of the challenges is providing user-friendly reporting mechanisms for their early learning indicators. 
And then it also looks like a lot of people have uh, said that another challenge is helping educators use early warning system information. All right, great. Um, with I'm going to hand it over to Susan. Susan? Thanks, Jenny. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I hope that um, we'll at least be able to provide some information about some of your challenges um, with regard to implementation of early warning systems today. Um, but first, I just want to start off with discussing what is an early warning system so we're all on the same page. Early warning systems really rely on readily available data housed as a tool to accomplish the following. One, predict which students are at risk of missing key educational milestones target resources to support those students and to continue monitoring them as they get back on track for key outcomes, and then examining patterns and identifying uh, potential school climate issues or other issues that are prevalent in the school. So where do these come from? They Basically, over a decade ago, research on early warning indicators conducted by the Consortium for Chicago School Research and Johns Hopkins launched the idea of early warning system indicators used to identify students who are at risk of not graduating from high school in grade nine and in the middle grade. So soon after that, the use of an early warning system was highlighted in the Institute for Education Sciences Dropout Prevention Practice Guide. And it's a frequently cited strategy to improve graduation rates, as many of you already know. Um, from these efforts, synthesis of research and implementation guidance from the National High School Center, um, has, there's been a lot of support provided to states, districts, and schools who are interested in using early warning system indicators. And the key thing about early warning systems is that it's about taking action, supporting students, improving student outcomes. Those are the three key things to, to, to understand. And initially, um, these focus on indicators and key thresholds like attendance, course performance, and credit earned. Indeed, more recently, states, districts, and schools have begun to expand the use of early warning system indicators to support educators in identifying other important educational mi milestones, including reading by the end of third grade, high school readiness, and even college readiness. So you can see that there's a lot of potential here. The key things for states to consider is that early warning system is an evidence-based practice that can support improvements in high school graduation and may support other key milestones. This is especially relevant since the recent reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, um, the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, as I like to call it, um, because these requ there are requirements within the act that, um, that many state stakeholders, I'm sure, have central in their minds. One is about the identification of high schools that have below a 67% graduation rate as low performing, and then using evidence-based practice to improve outcomes. And early warning systems can, can help to answer that in terms of an evidence-based practice for schools um, and districts and states considering how to guide their schools. So in my, um, sorry, I'm trying to move. Um, so my personal involvement and experience in early warning systems um, is really working with state education agencies, both um, providing technical assistance through the National High School Center and other projects that were really state focused. And working through as a thought partner as they consider the use of early warning systems within the state and what that means. Um, this early warning system pathway that you see before you um, was developed based on mine and my colleagues' work supporting these states and districts in the implementation of early warning systems. We call it the early warning system implementation pathway. It has five phases of implementation. And it's important to note that there are entry points for states throughout the implementation pathway. So we don't expect you to start at the top and move through. But you can enter at different places, and states indeed do. So for example, some states or districts choose to adopt commonly used early warning indicators and move straight to customizing and developing tools and support for schools. Um, others might even rely on some of the nationally available supports and resources and move directly into launching and implementing early warning systems. The point is that there are multiple places states can enter in when considering early warning system implementation. 
Each requires different levels of resources, skills, and capacity, and really state education agencies, and when we work with them, they really have to identify the place in the pathway that's most achievable for them in terms of what their resources are available. And it's always possible to go back to the earlier phases or let the work evolve over time and revisit some aspects of it. Many state education agencies actually do do this over time, and I think actually Massachusetts and Minnesota are both really good examples of how they let that pro process evolve. So why do states support early warning systems? So I just want to say, you might have noticed that in the initial definition that I mentioned readily available data housed in the schools, and I'm sure you wondered if you were even on the right webinar. Um, what does this have to do with states? Well, it's true. Early warning systems are best implemented at the level at which an adult directly interacts with a student. In order to change an at-risk student's outcomes, that's where the action is. So why would a state get involved in this work? Um, put simply, states sit in a really unique place to encourage the use of early warning systems in schools, and they have the data, and they often have the skills and capacity to do analyses of data um, and ultimately can establish a vision for supporting districts and schools through these efforts. And sometimes you can even help and create incentives, as you'll see. So typically, the focus of space is on three phases of the implementation pathway, validating indicators, tools and supports, and launching and implementing early warning systems. And that's what we'll highlight today. All right. <clears throat> so, Often states ask how they can possibly create incentive or leverage early warning system implementation. And um, these three strategies that I'm going to highlight are really based on our observations of how states have done this work. And it's worth noting that at least some of them can be used together or in conjunction. So the first is offering technical assistance and support to districts and schools. And um, this is really based on those districts and schools that are interested and that in early warning systems or increasing their graduation rates, they usually have their local incentive um, in term, or it's a local priority. For example, states could provide a report or a tool or implementation guidance to these districts and schools and just make that available so that districts and schools can grab that information as they need it. I've also seen states convene learning networks that allow cross-district sharing of strategies and really, that's just bringing um, districts together um, and schools. The key here is that participation is typically voluntary, and it allows districts and schools to decide whether and how deeply to participate. I know John will talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the, this limits challenges related to buy-in, um, but poses challenges with regard to really deep implementation and fidelity of implementation. The second incentive is through programmatic mandates. So um, one example of this are a grant or a program that requires the use of or reporting on early warning system indicators. So for example, um, a while back I was working with Texas and um, Texas grantees for a summer, who are implementing a summer bridge program between middle, for students between middle and high school. They were asked to report on, on participating students' early warning system indicators as they entered ninth grade and through ninth grade to see how effective the program was. But in turn, what was interesting is it started to pique the interest of several grantees, not all, but several grantees who requested support in thinking through early warning system implementation, which the state then provided. And subsequently, Texas has developed an early warning system that they share um, with all districts and schools. But it seems that um, we'll begin seeing more of these types of activities with ESE or ESSA, and um, this is really highlighting um, the high schools with a graduation rate, like I said, below 67%. So the third incentive is through legislative or regulatory mandates. For example, um, in Virginia, um, th there was a regulation change where accreditation, high school accreditation was being linked to high school graduation rates, and um, that led to many high schools becoming very interested and feeling a sense of urgency um, to identify strategies to improve their graduation rates because they were at risk of losing accreditation. Um, so they turned to the state actually offered early warning systems as a potential strategy to support them. Um, and I just also want to say even the threat of legislative mandates can actually um, 
create a sense of urgency and incentive. And that's something that we, we observed in California when there was some talk about holding middle schools accountable for high school graduation rates, which created this interest and incentive um, for districts and their middle schools to begin thinking about strategies to ensure students were on track for high school and middle school. And the state began to convene groups of middle schools and districts interested in this work, developing a network, and focused on implementing early warning systems in the middle grades. So what are the challenges? And I actually saw some of the challenges um, written in a few places. Um, and I'm sure these have already popped into your head as we've been talking. The most frequently cited challenges are local control, state capacity, resources, and you know, attention to other priorities that are not necessarily focused on, for example, increasing high school graduation rates. And this is a reality for many states. And it's the reason each state really has to figure out the strategy that works best for them. So given these challenges, states still have identified strategies for implementing early warning systems. And these include, so these include some examples of implementation strategies. Um, there are just a few that we've observed in our work, and obviously there are different configurations. But the important thing to note is that state efforts and strategies chosen take into account the specific state education agency's limitations in terms of resources and capacity. And again, these things can evolve over time as interest grows or priorities shift. So the first option is likely the easiest. There's voluntary participation. So again, it usually has states supporting implementation through providing tools and guidance, um, maybe even making them available on a website. So if a district or school was interested, they could download them. or and a little more intensely providing some professional development and just really opening it up to districts and schools that are interested. The other strategies that we've seen are pilots of early warning systems. Um, they're a little more directed than voluntary participation. And it's a pretty common approach. It relies on what I call the coalition of the willing, which are schools and districts that have already bought in and are interested in this type of support. Um, the pilots usually actually have a real benefit for state education agencies because they're often a safe space where um, state education agency stakeholders can really get some good information and feedback from schools and districts on er the early warning system supports they've developed or that they're using in order to improve these before perhaps they roll them out more broadly statewide. Um, another strategy is integrating indicators into the state data system. So it's really a key way to begin engaging districts and schools. And I'm sure many of the stakeholders on the phone actually um, and on the webinar actually already are doing some of these things, um, including this. But the, in these instances, schools and districts have access to this information, whether they are ready to use it or not. And what I've observed is that there will be some early adopters who are really eager to engage and curious about what these indicators are and really start to get on board. Um, and then there still are other schools and districts that come on board later. Um, it really serves as a foundation for using this information. And because it's based on state data, there's a little more legitimacy to some of the indicators. For example, it might take into account the state assessment or some other data that are unique to the state. Um, so it really it really um, feels like a valid indicator. What are the incentives? <laughs> this question always gets asked. So obviously, high school graduation rates and improving these are a priority, are, could be a priority of a governor or the state education agency. And when that occurs, it's a little bit easier to move forward with these efforts. But that doesn't always need to be the case. Um, it may be a local priority in pockets of schools throughout your state. Uh, for example, the Title I School Improvement Grant funds actually focused on high schools with low graduation rates. And thus, you know, kind of a, there was an early warning system implementation um, strategy that could become a priority in many of these schools and actually did. And one of the resources we provided demonstrates that um, it's a case study of a high school that didn't do that. Um, early warning systems are an interesting case because unlike some programs or interventions, the entry cost is really pretty low in terms of risk and resources. There are so many publicly available resources that it doesn't need to require starting from scratch, creating new materials, and it can be an interesting way to start off implementation. Again, thinking back about that implementation pathway and how you move through it. 
The resources can make it easy for schools and districts to engage in the work. The other is reporting, and I noted that many of you are looking for user-friendly reporting strategies, and I cannot emphasize enough how a user-friendly report can really become an incentive. Nothing is more likely to stall or stop an effort to implement early warning systems than a bunch of data that school leaders and educators really aren't sure how to use when they have so, they have so many pressures and limited time. So finally, um, so any kind of user-friendly reports are really helpful, and I know the states that are presenting today have pretty good examples of that. Monitoring progress is by observing change in the numbers of students who are at risk is another strategy. So one example is that Chicago Public Schools used an on-to-off-track on report and an off-to-on-track report during regular principal, me principal meetings throughout the school year. And this emphasized the importance of providing supports to those students who are identified as at risk. So they were really pushing taking action and allowed them to observe changes in individuals and groups of students' trajectories toward the outcome of high school graduation over time. So with this brief overview and very fast, I realized, I'd like to turn it over to our state education agency representative to talk through the details of their efforts. And first up is Kate Sandell from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary Secondary Education, and I'm going to hand it over. Kate? Great. Thanks, Susan. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all today. Um, I'm Kate Samuel. I'm with the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And I've been with the department for about five years now. And throughout my time here, I've been really actively involved with the development and implementation of our early warning system. Um, this fall will actually be the fifth release of our EWIS. Uh, which is what we call our early warning system. And it identifies students who are at risk of missing key academic milestones in grades 1 through 12. Um, and we developed this as part of our state longitudinal data systems grant. We worked actually with AIR in the initial development of the statistical models. And then the state has really worked on model updates and enhancements since then and supporting the ongoing implementation. Prior to EWIS, which focuses on grades 1 through 12, uh, Massachusetts had something called the Early Warning Indicator Index, which provided a risk level for rising ninth graders and looking at whether they were at risk of grad, uh, miss, not graduating on time. And what folks in the field who were using those reports said, this is great, except sometimes the kids are so off track by the time they get to ninth grade, it would really be helpful for us to know about these kids earlier. Um, and then also, it's great for us to know about our rising ninth graders, but it would be really helpful for us to know if our 10th, 11th, and 12th graders were getting back on track. So um, it was a result of that interest which really led Massachusetts to pursue um, this as part of the SLDS grant. Um, and it was helpful to have some people who were um, really interested in this to help promote its use once it was developed. So what we do with EWIS is we provide a student risk level at the beginning of each school year. Um, and this uh, helps, and we provide it for all students who attended a mass public school in the year prior, and we identify them as low, moderate, or high risk. Um, and what this risk level is indicating their likelihood of missing a key academic milestone. So for example, an eighth grade student that is high risk is considered to be off track or unlikely to meet the academic milestone of passing all grade nine courses. I'll walk through our academic milestones on the next slide. Um, and our threats for sort of each of our risk levels, those who are low risk, historically around 90% of those kids meet the academic milestone, whereas a moderate risk student, it's around 50% of those kids meet the academic milestone. And then high risk kids, um, fewer than 25% of those kids meet the outcome. So three out of four of our high risk kids, absent intervention, are unlikely to meet the next academic milestone. Um, and our EWIS student risk levels are based on statistical formulas applied to multiple sources of readily available data from the prior year. Um, a big push, at when we worked with AIR, one of the things they did is you know, a, a literature review of all potential indicators that could go into um, an early warning system. 
Um, but then we sort of had to call it back to, well, what do we have available and we have enough years of data that we can use it. Um, I was just doing an EWIS presentation yesterday and somebody brought up homelessness and is homelessness in our risk model. And unfortunately, um, we didn't have it available several years ago. We're starting to have more of that data available at the state level, so it's something that we could potentially look to include in, in future years. Um, but we really wanted to focus on EWIS being um, only existing data and hopefully turn around the substantial amount of data that schools and districts provide to the state to make something that could be a meaningful and user-friendly tool for, for districts and schools to use to help meet the needs of their students. Um, and so we do a statistical formula and include indicators um, such as attendance and behavior and um, whether or not the student moved schools during the years, course performance um, for middle school and high school students, the, that's included, um, our state assessment data for the relevant grades, um, the ELL, uh, the English proficiency for our ELL, ELL students, special education level of need, whether or not the student was retained, if the student's over age. Um, we, we take all of, of those indicators um, and create a model for, for each rising grade level um, to say whether they're, they're likely to meet the next academic outcome. Um, because we've gone this statistical formula, um, we have a, a little bit of a challenge where there is still some diagnostic work that has to occur at the local level to say, you know, what are the student's individual challenges and what might be the underlying cause of that student's risk. Um, we don't have a flag where they can look and say, this student's attendance was below 95%, so therefore they're, they're at risk. Um, and then we provide student level and aggregate EWIS information through our um, sec secure data portal. Um, we call it Edwin Analytics. And so these are available to school and district personnel um, who have access, and this is not publicly available, but folks can log on. And um, we definitely struggle with that user-friendly piece. When I get a little later on, I'll try to talk a little more about what the reports look like. Unfortunately, I did not include screenshots. So our academic milestones, we, we wanted to, to break it down um, so that each academic milestone was meaningful to folks at the different um, age ranges. So um, for students who are in grades first, through third, we do our proxy for reading at the end of third grade, which is reaching proficiency or higher on the third grade ELA state assessment. Um, for grades four through six, um, we look at whether or not they're likely to be middle school ready, which we say reaching proficiency or higher on sixth grade ELA and math state assessments. For students in grades seven through nine, we do high school ready, and it chose for that to be passing all grade nine courses. Um, and this, we really wanted our milestones to not all be assessment-based, so this um, passing all grade nine courses was really um, a helpful tool for us. And then for students in grades 10 through 12, we look at high school graduation and their likelihood of meeting all local and state graduation requirements. Now, in the column on, on the right, we see the statewide results for meeting the milestones, and those aren't the same. We have fewer students who are meeting the, the early elementary and late elementary outcomes. And what that means is, is a larger portion of students might be identified as high risk in those grades. Um, and so it's really helpful when schools and districts start to dive into their data to know how they're doing on those milestones, um, how, how many of their ninth graders are passing all grade nine courses is a really key piece of information for folks to have. And while um, Massachusetts, all the data does sort of follow the trend where these individual milestones do build on each other. Um, a student who's reading at the end of third grade um, or meeting that outcome is four times as likely to graduate on time. And um, for us, students who are passing all grade nine courses are 14 times more likely to graduate high school on time. Something. Okay, so just to take a, a second, one of our important things when we talk about EWIS is what it is and is not, and we really see it as a, a tool to better target interventions and supports to students at the individual, small group, and whole school level. 
Um, I know it's a challenge for some of our districts that have a lot of um, high needs students. Um, they might have a lot of high risk students and students who are potentially off track. Um, and for them, it, for those places, individual and small group interventions um, may be hard to identify directly through EWIS, and it might be thinking about whole school um, interventions instead. Um, but it's really important. EWIS is not a life sentence. We, it's not, we don't want it to be to a label for students. Um, we, it, it's something we, we hope all uh, high-risk students get additional interventions so that they're able to get back on track. Um, and it is a systemic way to flag students, but like I said before, it's not on its own a diagnostic tool. There's sort of local legwork that needs to go in, into place in order to say why a student might um, not be meeting the expected milestone. Um, and on its own, EWS is not an accountability measure. Um, in some cases, it might be helpful to look at what the percentage of, of students in a school or district who are higher, uh, moderate, or low risk over time. Um, but it's, it's far more important to track those academic milestones and see how many of your students are passing all grade nine courses or graduating or um, reaching proficiency on those state assessments. Um, and the state assessments, proficiency, and high school graduations are part of the accountability measure, so EWIS is related to it, but on its own it is not. Um, and then it is based on data, and the risk models um, are reexamined every year. Um, and I'll touch on this a little bit in the challenge because we sort of have a changing data landscape um, as well as we, we want the models to be as reflective as what we see in the state as possible. Um, what this meant is as a state we've had to invest internal capacity to do this ongoing update um, and, and support of the work. So it's not a stagnant system that's the same year after year. Um, so in Thinking about our implementation, we definitely fall into that technical assistance and support type of SEA implementation. Um, and in the 2013-14 school year, we did an implementation pilot where we worked really closely with nine districts um, and had an initial implementation guide. And then throughout that year, um, edited the guide um, based on the experience of those nine districts. And so now we have that as a tool that's available on our web website, as well as we have these hard copy tabbed binders um, that we actively disseminate at all, all available, um, all avail available uh, activities. And um, the guide outlines really our, our, our cycle of uh, adapted cycle of inquiry. Um, a multi-step process that they can follow to ex uh, effectively use the early warning data, um, identifying students, exploring underlying causes of risk, interventions, monitoring, um, and then making improvements. Um, and what was nice by developing the guide with these nine districts, we're able to include anecdotes from the real world from these districts and schools. Um, we have prompts that encourage them to build upon their current practices. That was definitely um, those districts, they got engaged and they were like, we're going to create this EWIS team. Um, and then after that school year, they thought, you know what, let's embed this in something we have going on. Um, and that really uh, is something we hear again and again. We don't want this to necessarily be something brand new, add on, um, but how this can integrate in the work that's going on on the local level. Um, to improve student outcomes. Uh, and additionally, the guide has a set of guiding questions, checklists, tools after each step, and then additional tools and research. And of course, we worked, I should say, we worked with AIR uh, to de develop that guide and to evaluate that implementation project. Um, and this looks at our theory of action for the work um, and the, the EWIS is what we think of in terms of the data that the schools and districts um, download from the state, that transitional risk indicator analysis for their students, as well as the additional um, report available um, in Edwin, in that security portal. Um, but then there's also the monitoring indicators and diagnostic data, and that's, that's local data that we want schools and districts to, to use, and definitely 
it's, it's a challenge because at the state level, we get data at the end of the year of what happened the previous year. Um, and so, and when we think about tools and resources, um, we want to create tools that then folks can plug into what they do throughout the school year, um, how they can use the tools we develop to link with, with what they collect in an ongoing way so that they're able to, to monitor. Um, we also, another component of it is, is our guide resources, um, trainings, and supports. Um, and then, of course, the key component is the school-based team that, that actually sort of does the work. Um, and our intermediate outcomes are to improve the use of data, improve assignment of resources, Im uh, improve progress monitoring, and the overall goal is, of course, to improve student success in reaching the outcomes. That's what we want to see happen. This is our uh, implementation cycle, um, and it's, it's funny. I was trying to remember, because I know we adapted this based on our experience with the nine districts. And I think, I, I think there, I, I can't remember what it was before. <laughs> um, so I was trying to remember what the adaption was, and I don't quite have it in my mind. But for here, what we really like to, the idea is that there's a lot of work that occurs at the beginning of the school year, and this is where sort of the EWIS data is most potent and powerful for them. Um, and so we hope that folks get organized. They, they have to figure out who's going to be involved. And um, ideally, this might be an existing, um, sorry, I was reading a question. This might be a, a, an existing team um, or a, adapting some existing teams and frameworks that are in place. We then want folks to review the data. And then we go into exploring the underlying causes. And ideally, this is linking with some existing local data um, that can be used to diagnose what's going on, whether that's benchmark testing, IEP, qualitative information, um, whatever else the school might have to understand what um, might be placing students at risk. However, you need to nudge folks out of just talking about the data to taking action and assigning some interventions. And then ideally using monitoring, uh, student progress and interventions, using some sort of monitoring data throughout the year. And we want sort of those blue cycles to repeat. And this, this might be repeating um, at the end of a, a trimester, a quarter, at any sort of grading period, or maybe just once throughout the year. It's really sort of what makes the most sense for the school. Um, and this can get to the challenge of sort of local control. There's just a lot of variation in um, school cycles throughout Massachusetts, and we just want to make it as adaptive for folks as possible. And then, you know, re reflect, refine, and prepare for the next year. So um, one of the things for Massachusetts is uh, EWIS is actually an explicit strategy in our state's plan to promote success after high school. Um, and it's funny, I, I didn't put it on the slide, and I think it's because I so it's so integrated into our college and career readiness efforts, um, our dropout prevention, as well as our promotion of high school graduation. Um, for those of you who don't know delivery, it's a methodology around goal setting and tracking progress. And so um, it's something we talk about a lot. It's definitely sort of on the commissioner's uh, radar screen on a regular basis. Um, and like I said, it's a key part of our dropout prevention and recovery work. Most all of any of the in-person trainings that we have with schools and districts throughout the year as part of that team, there's usually an EWIS mention or an EWIS component. Um, I, I, I guess we're in the fifth year and I'm finally feeling um, a little bit of the, the fruit of the labor where if I'm in, was in some trainings the last two days and when I said, has anyone heard of EWIS or used EWIS, we, we had a high number of people who were raising their hands, well over, over half of the percent. But it's definitely been a bit of a challenge over time to get people to know about EWIS and to, and to use it. I would say three years ago, if I had a question in a room of, um, 75 or 80 educators, I might have only had a handful, whereas yesterday was around 60 or 70 percent of them were talking about having used EWIS. Um, uh, so we do extensive in-person trainings with school and district teams. Uh, we also do webinars throughout the year. 
Um, and I'll give a, spe a special mention to, we've done a lot of work with our state association of school counselors, um, where a colleague on the College and Career Readiness team um, has done a lot of, of, of trainings and gone to some of their convenings and gatherings to increase the, the use and capacity among, among that group with this data, because uh, the school counselors are such a key component of, of qualitative data and, and local data about the students and youth. Um, in addition to these uh, in-person trainings and, and webinars, we have in-depth videos on Edwin, which is, again, our online portal. Um, but there's also a, a link that we're able to provide to, to people generally so that they can get familiar with this, this um, tool, um, or rather these reports. And it was we, we contracted out for the development of, of this in-depth video where they really walk through each report um, and it, it, it's almost like a, a lead PowerPoint where um, you really describe and, and can move through various questions and components of the, the, the reports. Um, and we definitely try to link with other agencies, programs, and priorities. Um, and I I think I, I saw in, in the chat box the multiple tiered systems of support question get asked, and that's definitely um, a group that we try to work with as closely as possible. Um, I would say on the local level, the MTSS teams are um, a key group that comes to the, the trainings that we have um, to try to understand how to use EWIS more. Within the agency, we definitely want to cross-pollinate and um, increase the the, the linkage is there, um, and I'll also mention MTSS as well as um, the other two units I talk about here are part of our EWIS advisory group, and so we have an inter interagency advisory group that provides feedback and information um, to our EWIS youth, and just it increases their awareness of it as well as um, provides really helpful feedback into how to increase our reach. Um, our Office of School and District Turnarounds work with our highest need districts, um, our level our level four and five districts. Um, and so we work with them, and they're, they're the lowest performing schools and districts. Um, we're closely with them to go out and do special trainings and provide special support to, to those um, schools to try, try to help their youth. And then we also have the District, of, District and School Assistance Center, um, which for us are data specialists that work with level three. Those are the lowest 20% of schools and districts in our state. Um, and that's, again, helping those data specialists know the most about um, EWIS as possible and help support them in supporting schools and districts around EWIS use, as well as, again, using that as a, a regional approach to go out um, and leverage EWIS trainings. So really exciting for us under the next steps um, that I got mentioned in the introduction, we're um, expanding to look at college going and college ready outcomes uh, as part of our new state longitudinal data system grant um, in which I'm right now excitingly diving into all the data to do predictive models for rising 10th, 11th, and 12th graders on college success outcomes. Um, it'll be college going, taking, uh, avoiding remediation and persisting to the second year. Um, we're also developing a, a training environment so that um, we can even dive in with ed prep programs to help those educators understand around using EWIS um, as well as do more uh, live trainings with EWIS data because it's student level data. We can't really do a live environment. Um, and we're getting a EWIS training and implementation specialist, so an additional person to, to go out and support folks um, using this on the local level. Some things around challenges, and these are really explicit. These are challenges we face at the state level in supporting, supporting folks. Um, and one of the big things is this is a transitional data point, um, our, our, EWIS student, our EWIS risk level. So we want to get it as early in the school year as, as we can. Ideally, it would be over the summer. However, um, we rely on data that doesn't come in <laughs> until the summer. Um, and so it, it's a real challenge for us because um, people would really love to use it in, that, in, in August as teachers are coming back before kids get back, especially, you know, 
in sixth grade and in ninth grade where there are new kids entering the building. Um, so we really struggle with that and have been trying to push to get data from schools and districts earlier so that we can turn it around. Um, but that being said, we also know local capacity in order to provide the data. Now, I, I, I put in this, this challenge around responding to the changing data landscape, and this really comes in where the state has had to continue to invest resources, um, a person like me, to, to update and adjust and adapt our model as we deal with the fact um, that we have a changing state assessment, um, that our free and reduced produced lunch, which was our low income variable, switched to community-wide eligibility. Um, so that it's great we're, we're feeding more, more students who are in need. Um, it's hard for us because we've lost what we considered low income kids. We don't sort of have that consistent over time. Um, so that produced a challenge. Um, and we've also had changes in suspension, changes in ling English language proficiency tests. So this is our fifth year release. I've listed four, four ch changes we've had. So we've had sort of a change at least every year that, that I've been here that we've had to, to work on it. Um, Additionally, it, a challenge is that there is this diagnostic work that has to uh, occur on the local level of why a student is, is high risk, risk um, that this is a, a regression model that, that was done, so it's not one thing that made a kid at risk, um, but it's, it's the combination of everything. Um, and so that's definitely been a challenge because some people, it would be easier to understand if it was just a, a flag of attendance made this kid high risk. Um, and then the, the, other, the other challenge is, sorry, the other challenge is um, to help the districts link our data with this local monitoring, and that definitely comes up as the challenges you all identified as, as your primary challenge. And so this is really um, about pulling the student um, local data, and we just have so many local student information systems that are active in the state that it's hard to figure out how we can create a tool that would help folks um, monitor or integrate the U.S. transitional indicator with their local data to monitor students throughout the year. Um, it's definitely been a big challenge. We're hoping with this implementation specialist as they dig in deeper with some um, folks throughout the next year that will help design and develop a tool that might be able to be useful for the majority of sites so that we'll have something for the following school year. So with that, I will um, hand it over to, to John and um, learn about Minnesota. Thank you. Um, and uh, welcome everybody. And I, you know, I just want to let you know, um, I've learned so much from talking to other, others about their uh, state early warning systems. And I really hope uh, um, I can offer some insights to you and, and as well as uh, those others who are on this presentation. Um, but I'm excited to talk about uh, what we have going on. Um, so just a bit of an overview. So basically our MIRS system, uh, we call it the Minnesota Early um, Intervention and Response System, um, it uh, has a report that includes aggregated data and a list of um, students with, with risk factors. So it's a pretty simple report um, that offers people uh, really a just snapshot in, in time. So we've picked sixth and ninth grade as uh, those grades that are going to be um, shown in this report. Um, partly those are transition years. Uh, so sixth is going into middle school, ninth into high school. Um, it turns out that both of those years in our system, in our state for um, assessment and in uh, reading and math that are used in, as part of our uh, variables, um, they both have three years of data uh, prior um, that can be used as part of part of the uh, math behind the scenes um, to flag kids for in in, the, in those areas. Um, and so we have, so it is a snapshot, but we have an ultimate goal of tracking um, risk factors in in real time. Um, and the, the system requires a team 
of folks at a, at a district level, um, problem solving, uh, the, uh, and analyzing data, uh, determining the root cause to match uh, potential supports and interventions. Um, and we hope at both the universal targeted and more intensive level. So really thinking about a multi-tiered system of support going on. Um, and we do require uh, a completion of training before the report can be accessed here um, at the state. Um, and each district has one person that's designated by, by the superintendent. So um, that may answer a question. Some of you may know that some states uh, give access to the data to everyone. We at, in Minnesota uh, do require those two things. Um, there was, when it was originally put together, um, I wasn't part of the system at that point um, when they were building the system. And we've only been in it for um, two updates now. So we've had, you know, we basically have three uh, sessions of data that, ha that have been uh, twice updated. So um, when it was originally built, uh, there was some concern that we wanted people to use the data appropriately and, and, and knowing that we can't control that completely, we wanted to have some control over, over that use um, at the training level. So at least giving people some idea about where the resources are, what, how to look at it, what, how we can use it. Um, and that, that it's just a really just a, a piece of the puzzle of a, of a larger implementation process that we'll, we'll take a look at. So I've been with this system since um, the, about a year. Um, transitioned, and, and I also will be touching on that a bit, is that um, in my transition, we built a transition team at the state because uh, we wanted to build in some protection uh, for turn turnover so that there's just, there, you know, there's good to have a champion of, of certain um, initiatives going on, but um, want to make sure that there are others that are involved so that they can move in um, when somebody might might leave for whatever reason. So this is uh, the seven-step process in our implementation process. Um, you can see it's kind of similar to what you saw with um, Massachusetts. Um, so really, when you look at, at the seven steps that are presented there, you know, there's really, you, you can see that you have to establish a team first, and this is what we talk about in the, in the training. Um, and once you do that and train people, um, we, we generally are cha cha training one person at the district with access, and they are uh, then charged with, with training others as, as they access it and, and, and hand it out to people. Um, so actually looking at the, the data doesn't actually come until step four. Um, when we're really, you're, you're running that, that uh, report that's available, but then in step five, there's a, this digging deeper piece where we're really digging into more local data and, and looking at it as in comparison with the, with the MIRS report. Um, so we really focus on, on that area, and that's where you, in the Massachusetts one, you saw the, the smaller loop where they're really looking in at the root cause and picking um, appropriate supports uh, for what is needed. Um, a lot of that is built into that one step we have here. And then, you, and similarly, um, you're selecting you're selecting those supports and, and then monitoring as you go. Um, but this process really, you know, guides users through making informed decisions on the basis of, of the indicators um, that we present and in, uh, that they can find in their local data. Um, and it's modeled after a process established by the National High School Center at the uh, American Institute for Research. Um, and we have an implementation guide that contains a separate section for each one of these seven steps. Um, uh, but because it's a continuous improvement process, the steps, you know, may be revisited and oftentimes they overlap with each other. So a lot of that is brought out in the training as well. So I have a poll for you at this point. Here it comes. So if you don't mind uh, responding to this, we... Um, we did have a survey, which I'll talk about later, but I was just curious what percentage of respondents do you guess claim to be implementing all seven steps of the, the MIRS implement, 
supplementation process. We ask this of our uh, of our districts who have access and who had already gone through training um, to go through those seven steps. Um, we asked a lot of other questions in our survey as well, um, and uh, we'll, I'll touch on some of the, the the lessons learned from that in a little bit. Okay. I think we got. Uh, All right. Um, I want to ask my um, my host because I'm not quite sure how to get out of this. Or if um, oh, there we go. do it. It's so great to have smart people behind the scenes working on this stuff. Um, but I wanted to see the results of that poll, which I'm not seeing on my screen. But we can. So I'm not sure what everyone is seeing right now. There we go. Okay. So we re okay. Here is the poll. So I just wanted to take a look at what people thought. I'm going to get there eventually, folks. Um, so it looked pretty split um, as most people picked um, the smallest amount that would probably have gone through all of that. Um, and according to our survey, there, there was actually very few that had gone through the seven-step process. So we realize that it is um, a pretty big challenge and, and a lot to expect of folks, um, and there's lots of reasons behind that. But that's what we really wanted to dive into is, is what is keeping people from getting to that. And I think there was, in our poll, it was very, like, single digits of people who were actually doing all seven steps of the process. Um, but some were, were, there were a lot that were, in, in between. Um, but um, it, the basic intent of, of um, this is that we, have a, we see a real value in tracking the progress of students who are identified as, um, identified as exhibiting risk factors. But at the same time, the intent is really not just to uh, raise rates of graduation, but to really engage the children and youth in school and help them graduate with the knowledge and skills necessary to meet challenges, um, um, and as with most efforts, challenges exist. There are real capacity issues, both for p in uh, people capacity and local data systems, and, um, and issues with knowing what really works to engage students, which is what we really try to focus on uh, with folks. Um, but obviously, um, using NEARS to identify students only get us so far. So, you know, the real folks is all about offering proven supports and then measuring how much and how well we do them as intended. Um, and we, that can be a whole different webinar talking about, about that piece. But um, as the implementation specialist at the department, that's what we try to focus on um, in some transformation zones in, in our state with certain practices that we, we know are proven and have some measures built in is really measuring the adult behavior and um, not in an effort to evaluate people, but in an effort to see what supports they need to do that work even better um, as it's intended and as it's supposed to be in order to, in, the, in its proven state. Um, so that's a, a place we want to go um, in the future. So once um, the data system was created and available, we learned a lot during the first year and a half of training and offering technical assistance for people. Um, one area of learning was how um, the data was presented in the report. Uh, and this that you're seeing here is just a section of the full report um, as it used to be and caused some confusion um, as, as, we, as we learned. So we found that you know, the terminology um, wasn't real clear. Um, down here, um, like actually up in here where we have at risk and identified, um, those terms weren't real clear right off the bat. And then down here in the note section, it wasn't really explained very well. And so it took a lot more training just to get people to actually understand um, 
what this was trying to tell them. Um, and then we had these percentages displayed on the graphs above, which you don't see in this section here, um, but there was displays above. And you can see these percentages are all pretty close to each other. So it gave kind of a, uh, a, a skewed idea of the data because you can see the at-risk numbers are very different. And so all the bars on the chart look very similar, but the actual occurrence and number of students was very different. Um, and you can also see down here, we tried to describe some of the, um, the variables, and nothing really stood out. It was just kind of white noise as I describe it down there. So, you know, we tried to um, make some improvements. And so our, our display looks something like this now. Um, it shows charts now that are redesigned to show the count of students at risk in both uh, variables and the, the special populations. Um, which are some of the, the risk factors. And uh, the top of the report that's not shown here still uses some percentages of students at risk um, it, at the state, district, and school level uh, as they choose for the report. <clears throat> um, but this data shown here and other school data are presented um, in, in the tables below the charts you can see. And, um, we made, I was just going to point out, the risk factors down here, you can, you can barely see it in here, but you can see that they kind of stand out more. They're, they're separate from the descriptions over here, so they, they're a little, little more easier to understand. The, the notes section is longer and describes more about what's, what's actually happening. And I'm going to be able to blow this up for you, too, so we can see that notes section down here. And then you can see we changed some of the terminology here as well. So we have those that are analyzed and at risk. So what used to be identif um, identified is now analyzed, because the whole definition of who is identified is those who had enough data to actually work in the system. Some students are missing data, and they're listed uh, separately in, in the spreadsheet report on another tab, so that schools can go look at those kids, find out what data is actually missing, and maybe, and maybe find that data. And, um, so we're using different terminology, explaining it better, um, making charts a little easier to understand right when you look at them. We're all simpler things we could change pretty quickly, and it allowed, we're hoping, for uh, training to be easier and having to do less. Um, and, and the easier we make the display, the, the more uh, we're going to have people using it. Um, so this was kind of phase one. We're hoping that phase two, um, we can do some other things. Um, we have hopes of, of making data more real time. Or we can only update it once a year, and it's kind of delayed because of certain factors. Um, a lot of schools would like to look at newer data during the summer. Um, ours updates in February. Um, but also just changing some of the default settings in the display itself um, takes some more IT uh, work and, uh, and resources that um, aren't really available at this time. So our current support at the state level um, is, is supporting the data system itself, and it's also providing some, some basic training um, and offering guidance and, and technical assistance. Um, so we have an, a team to oversee the work, uh, and, and as I said before, this offers some protection uh, for turnover and uh, keeps more people involved in the work and knowing about the work so they can apply it in, from, into their appropriate divisions. Um, trying to break down some of those silos so that everybody takes ownership of, of tools like this. Um, and we also have support from our regional centers of excellence. Um, our regional centers of, of excellence have, have primarily been in working with our priority and focus schools, our lowest performing schools, um, and some of our, you know, in, in some of the lowest tiers of performance in, in the schools to give extra support. Uh, we have some, some work um, we've done some work with them, um, depending on how the funding flows, to, to do some of the training last year, and then some really scaled back training this year. We found we just didn't have the capacity for as much face-to-face -face training as, as we uh, had hoped. And um, so this year, all of our training was done via webinar um, by just a couple people, and um, at least got people familiar with what we wanted to show them, where the resources are, and then we can turn them over to, to 
to use the data as as they found fit. Um, so we're hoping that um, through more, as more resources become available, we can we can offer more support. Um, but we also um, Rel Midwest uh, helped us administer that survey I was talking about for districts that um, have had um, access to mirrors, and it revealed that we have a lot of room for growth in the use of mirrors itself. Um, there was a lot of response that that showed us that they found their local data um, more useful, which we're, we weren't really surprised by because that can be really rich data. Um, and we we're happy that they find that really um, useful. There are some schools have and districts have better data systems than others. Um, but since our, our, our MIRS data is really limited, they rely heavily on that local data. Um, and the, the districts also expressed uh, interest in ongoing training. So even if they are looking at their local data, how can we support them in that analysis and looking at the root cause? And, and then especially in ways that they can support the students that, that they're identifying um, and, and engaging those students. Um, there is a, 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 a strong interest in in getting more ongoing training in those areas. So it prompted us to think about how we are doing our training. Um, and it has been more, um, while we we're trying to talk about the whole process, we also are aware that we kind of put the, the MIRS data front and center. We talk a lot about that, so we can kind of, we might be giving the impression that, that that's the, the most important part when as I've expressed through this, um, we really want them to focus on generally what are we doing for dropout prevention and how, how is this a piece of the puzzle? What are all these other pieces that you really um, might need help with um, moving along? Okay, I think I have another poll for you. There we go. So I was interested in, in uh, we asked in our survey about the interventions that people use. So we were wondering what intervention strategies have been useful in your experience for getting kids back on track for, it, for graduation. Um, you might be more connected with students um, than some of the others. You know, it depends on how far you removed you are from the schools. But um, if you can think about what you've experienced. Yeah, and it looks like um, the ninth grade transition program and assigning adult advocates to students who are at risk are really um, coming out as strong. Um, in our poll, the, um, the offering counseling and um, tutoring, along with um, you know, things like partnering um, and stuff, um, came out as strong, encouraging and family engagement and that kind of stuff. Um, which is really interesting because those are a little lower on, on this scale, but um, but that seemed to be some of the, the those things that they found most useful in their process. So so it kind of gets gets at um, the idea that there's such a wide range of things that you can do. How do we really focus on what those things are that are proven? And that we can measure in schools and then and then be able to actually connect what we're doing with the outcomes for kids. So we want to look at adult behavior and those outcomes to give feedback and support and then connect it to those student outcomes. And then we can actually get to a point where we can repeat what we found successful. Um, and that's where we hope to move. So um, dropout prevention is really an important effort here in Minnesota. Um, we have a goal to reach 90% uh, four-year graduation rate by 2020 with no student group um, under 85%. Um, and MIRS obviously is part of that effort, but you know it doesn't work for everyone either. For example, um, we have um, some identi schools identified for their graduation rate in our state, come, uh, 
and many of them are alternative schools. And just by their nature, um, some of them have the greatest struggles with graduation because of the population of students they serve. Um, and a lot of their students are beyond ninth grade. So the MIRS data doesn't even uh, help them at all because they have no sixth or ninth graders in their school. And even if they did, all the kids would probably be flagged anyway. So, um, so some situations like that, it, it may not be as helpful. So, so really, they, we need to focus on local data there and, and what are those strategies that are really going to work in those situations. Um, we have um, some other work like our State Systemic Improvement Plan, we call it SSIP, um, which is really looking at that transformation zone. Um, we're looking at four different districts uh, at dropout prevention for these specific student groups um, that are listed here. And they are really doing some intentional work using implementation science um, to look at those strategies that are proven, can be measured, and there's going to be some really amazing data coming out of that. Um, uh, so we're going to actually know how well and how much we did of that intervention and, and then see what the outcomes are. If we do really well, we'll know perhaps why. If we do poorly, we'll know, well, maybe this wasn't the right strategy. So we'll, we'll be able to at least have a couple pieces of data there to, to really look at what is really working in the school and are we really doing what we said we were going we were to do. And we also partner with folks like um, Grad Minnesota uh, uh, to explore other proven supports. They have a lot of um, a, a expertise and knowledge to, to share with us. So I'm going to end it there, and um, I'm going to turn it back over to the, our hosts. Great. Uh, thanks, John. So this is Jenny Scala again. And, um, we had some time to answer some of the questions that you all have submitted. So the first one that I want to start out and have um, both Kate and John discuss is the notion of, is your early warning system uh, mandatory for schools to use and implement? So Kate, why don't you start? So no, it is, is not required. Um, and I love that folks have to go through training before getting um, the data, <laughs> because I am very scared of, of some misuse. I know just through um, a, something a district said to someone else, they initially planned the first year the U.S. came out to just send a letter home to parents telling them what their kid's risk level was, <laughs> which is not a good use of, of our, our risk data. Mm -hmm. And so we really try to promote what good use is. Um, we don't have either a training requirement to get it. And folks aren't required to use it. Um, we definitely see this as this is a tool that we want folks to use and try to make it as helpful as possible. But it is not mandatory. I'll also say there isn't a cost to districts either for folks to download any of the data um, from um, our state security secure portal um, so they can get the e-risk risk information. Um, there's then sort of up to the, the, the usage of that data on the local level might have some capacity costs, but um, they get access to it for free and to all of our tools and Great. resources we develop. Great. And John, what about in Minnesota? Yeah, it is definitely not um, required. Um, and as I said, you know, you have to go through training and and be designated by your superintendent. And they have to re-designate people every year as, as the policy works right now. So we're really looking at that because, you know, we did some work with Wisconsin as well, and they uh, have a very different process. And they're our next-door neighbors here um, where they, they give access to everybody without any training, um, not everybody, but, you know, to, mm -hmm. to school districts that would normally have access to other data. Um, and we're really questioning you know, do we, do we really need to be this strict about who gets access to this data? Because we have a lot of other data that we don't do this with. Um, I think this data was a little different and when they were putting it together and they weren't quite sure of the display when it was happening and, and how all that was going to be interpreted. So, um, so, you know, we're at a place where we now can reevaluate and we've certainly pared it back. We used to have, uh, you know, more face-to-face -face and longer training sessions than we do now. 
So we'll we'll keep thinking about that. Great. And building on this just a little bit, um, one question that was submitted also was on the approximate cost of early warning system work in a typical district. Um, and I believe the question that was submitted had maybe Massachusetts in mind and maybe not with the language of uh, having multiple priority schools. And so, Kate, you had talked about that the data are available, but that there might be some local capacity that's necessary. So how do you answer the question of what the approximate cost is um, for a typical district with multiple priority schools? Well, I, I just don't, I, I don't know, um, I don't have an answer to that. Um, because I, I think there's a lot of, of components that get into that. I mean, when we're thinking about it, are we just talking about the data infrastructure cost um, and even the capacity around getting that data and interpreting it? And then, or are we talking also about the, the interventions that are sort of that key piece in using the early warning data is what you choose to do as a result of that? Um, and I definitely don't know that is super variable um, in terms of, of how much those those interventions would cost. Um, and I would say there are some places that, you know, they might have a very data savvy person in, you know, the assistant superintendent position where they download our student level risk report, input that into Tableau, um, and then merge in local data throughout the year. And so there isn't that much of a cost, and the person's pretty quick with it, and so there isn't that much of a time cost on it versus someone else might choose to purchase a proprietary software um, that th they use for that or get a additional supports through their student information systems. And I just don't know enough. We have so many different districts um, with so many different ways that they pocket it. I, I wouldn't know about it. I think somebody responded in, in the chat box that it that it's really variable um, and I think that would be my guess but it would just be a guess great and it looks like there's a follow-up question too on uh, if the trainers who train on the data systems also train on the systems and practices aspect yeah. Um, yeah do, do you want to take that John yeah I can go with that um mm -hmm. I our training that we have currently is a uh, we do it as a using webinar software, and um, it just lasts about an hour um, just to get people oriented to it. So um, the training, as far as other interventions and stuff, is is not happening through the same system. Um, they might get that through other other initiatives going on or. Um, through support that they're getting, you know, if they're a priority focus school or continuous improvement school, as we as we name some of the lower performing schools, um, they're going to they're going to get that kind of training elsewhere because we just don't have that right now. Um, and but we're talking about how we're going to change change our, our system of training people, but we're going to need other resources to do that because our our team is small. Um, and there's, there aren't a lot of resources dedicated to getting this done. I mean, we just as an example, you know, we did some training around January, February when the data system updated. Well, there are people now that are not asking, you know, I, I want to get access to it. My superintendent is, you know, there might be some turnover, they're, they're new or whatever, and they need training now. So we just set up a bunch more of these trainings for people um, just to get them on board. Um, and I'm one of the people that does it, and it's you know it's kind of like a an extra thing I do with all this other stuff I'm doing. Um, and I, we have one of our um, advocates in our regional centers that, that has some dedicated time to supporting this. So that that is one benefit we have. Um, but we have the internal team that's now discussing how are we going to move forward and, and what kind of resources can we gather to to try to um, make it happen in a better way. Great. Another question that we got was um, on English language learners, and uh, the um, participant was curious if there were additional factors that you consider when identifying English language learners at risk of not succeeding in school.
So for Massachusetts, in our in our risk model, we um, don't look at the other risk factors through the the lens of whether or not they're in ELL. Um, it's the English proficiency level um, is a variable, and then it's in the regression, holding other things constant. Um, so we don't um, pull that out in particular. Um, I, I, I will say we have another unit that we've worked closely with is um, the ELL unit, and we have a group that's looking of districts that are looking at first language, not English dropouts, and trying to address that system uh, or that group. Um, and US data, um, along with an additional tool that analyzes dropouts, um, has, has been a, a lens that we've focused on to, to help people um, identify the needs of that group. Um, but that's sort of a, a different data tool that's used in conjunction with EWIS. So not, we haven't done any work around ELL specifically, and there an increase around particular indicators. Yeah, I don't have any information about that either, just that we flag students in the system uh, for limited English proficiency. But um, um, what they do at that point is, is not part of, of what we're dealing with here. Uh, we have other and systems that support them, of course. Yeah. And then I, I will say, when in our student level list, we have sort of information about the student, their risk level, all the indicators that went in the model. And then we have data that um, isn't in the model, but that might have changed for that student. And it was um, input from folks in the field and um, our ELL staff that we add the current ELL uh, placement and the current ELL status to sort of that group because folks have found that helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and so this uh, next question, I'm also going to see if Susan has anything that she wants to share. Um, I know one of the challenges that she had mentioned at the beginning of the webinar was um, on local control. And um, someone asked if there were any tips or experiences of how to um, really support implementation of early warning system work in a local control state. Um, yeah. That's a really good question, and that is typically um, the almost every state education agency I've worked with the um, the focus. And so I would say that um, both Minnesota and Massachusetts provide really good examples of that um, in terms of one trying to engage stakeholders that are interested in the work already. Um, so they're not trying to win over um, necessarily um, individuals who aren't um, districts and schools, local education agencies that aren't actually interested in participating in this work. Um, and as I mentioned, other options that I've observed are programmatic requirements in terms of reporting. And again, using that as a way to trigger some um, interest in the use of an early warning system more broadly um, by requiring them to report an early warning system indicators. So, you know, there's a lot of different strategies that can be embedded. Um, and I really, I mean, that pushback, the local control pushback is a very real thing. Um, and I think that um, I, I'm more familiar with the Massachusetts work. And, you know, there's a really good example where they've had a long standing network of districts and schools. Um, they started maybe, I'm going to say, with about 10, and Kate, you would know better than I, but where that over time um, interest started to grow and people started to gain interest and were asking to be part of that network. So it was, you know, came down to, based on the good work they had been doing, people asking to go to another meeting, <laughs> which I think <laughs> is a good testament mm. to the work that they are doing. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, starting small and demonstrating value slowly, but, you know, kind of sharing information as well is just one, one way um, that a state education agency can do that. And actually from that network, a lot of the the legacy of that network or those initial members is a lot of the work that the state's doing now with regard to early warning indicator systems. So I answered for Kate. Sorry, Kate. I, <laughs> no. I'm, it's not a video, so you can't see me nodding my head, but I'm nodding and going, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. John, would you add anything to that? 
No, I think I think you're uh, right on point with that. You know, it is a real thing, local control, and um, you know, I think part of the, what we do with training actually gives us a little more control over that because because of that factor that it is local control. We wanted to keep a little bit of the control, and that's the only uh, that's one of the ways we could do it, I suppose. Um, uh, so yeah, it would be if we were to require it. It would I I would guess it would take a almost a statutory um, requirement of some kind. You know, I mean, there would have to be a law made or at least a, uh, the authority to make some kind of policy like that. Um, yeah, and there's not a lot of interest from many state education agencies in that just because it just opens up a whole different can of worms. Mm -hmm. And as Kate pointed out, really, it's an idea that's supposed to be supportive of educators trying to help students. It's not an accountability measure. and you know, sometimes that can get confused when you start to get legislation and those mm -hmm. sorts of mandates. Yeah. And I mean, my concern a, a little bit is if it became required um, that then you might get the minimum amount I have to do to meet that requirement instead of really thoughtful integration yeah. and using it in a positive way. Right. It comes compliance and not yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Great responses. Um, and there was um, a question that was on the connection to multi-tiered system of support, and, and I know that Kate answered that. I also know that um, on the uh, REL Learning Series um, webpage, which was posted in the chat box for everybody, um, there was a webinar that was done in the not-too-distant past on the connection of early warning systems and multi-tiered systems of support. So that would be another resource for folks. And then um, another link that I posted was to the College and Career Readiness and Success Center's state profile map. Um, some people asked about wanting to know what other states are doing in terms of early warning system work. So that would be another place to go to. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Erin, who's going to wrap up today. All right. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you all for joining us today. In about two to three weeks, you'll receive a thank you email from us with a link to the webinar archive. Uh, we appreciate your completion of the feedback survey. You'll see the link there. And have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody.